the liquid the Permian Basin produces in the largest quantity is, of course, oil. The basin accounts for nearly 40% of all oil production in the United States. But there are other liquids flowing in the basin, from the brewing of craft beers to the growing of grapes and production of wine. So tonight we ask, who's in the spirit in the basin? I'm Becky Ferguson, and this is One Question. Who's in the spirit in the basin? Texas is the fifth largest wine producing state in the country. There are 500 wineries and 5,000 acres of wine grapes grown in Texas. But the largest winery is right here in West Texas, just outside of Fort Stockton. Tonight we'll take you there. But should your taste lean more toward barley than grapes, we'll also show you some brewing right here in the basin. A lot of people doesn't know where St. Genevieve Winery is located. You know, they see our uh, brand name, you know, all over the stores, you know, in Texas, because we are actually in all the big grocery stores, you know, our biggest, you know, buyers, it's actually H-E-B. If they look on the back, they say, Fort Stockton, Texas, well, where that is? <laughs> you know, where that is? And then a lot of people, you know, came here and, and said, wow, we didn't know this winery, you know, was here. I'm visiting with Michelle Dufereau with Mesa Vineyards here outside of uh, Fort Stockton. And thank you so much for letting us come. And we're standing in a, a storage room with immense tanks full of wine ready to be bottled. Uh, can you tell us um, how it is that a, a winery, a vineyard came to be in West Texas? It's the University of Texas you know, that decided years ago, that was in the early 80s, that uh, to see if they could grow some grapes you know, in West Texas. So they had uh, an experimental vineyard that was about five miles from here, and where they planted about 30 acres of grapes, different varieties, and they study you know, how they develop and how good you know, the results would be you know, to make some wine. And they found out you know, that actually we can grow grapes in West Texas, even with, uh, it's not an ideal climate, but we grow grapes, so we can grow grapes, and so they decided to have that land that was practically, you know, uh, empty and flat with a lot of water resource, you know, under, underground. They decided to plant a commercial vineyard, and they planted, you know, a thousand acres, and they started the first plantation in 1981, 82, 83, and then they finished it in 84. So this is how they decided, you know, to grow a vineyard here. Michelle, I noticed that you don't have a Fort Stockton accent. Would you tell us where you're from and how you got here? Well, I'm from Bordeaux, France, originally. Uh, I was working for a French company that was doing a lot of uh, business for wineries, you know, in France. And my background is uh, electrotechnics, which has nothing to do uh, at the beginning with wine. But, you know, we work in the industry, you know, in France with uh, the company I was working with. And they had a project, you know, coming up here in Fort Stockton. So they, uh, they sent me here, you know, to, to start, you know, the, the construction of this winery. Uh, it was for, to do all the automation, I mean, the reception of the grapes, the fermentation, the production and everything. And uh, I was here for three weeks to, to actually start, you know, this project. And that is more than uh, 30 years now, I'm still here. Well, that's, glad you're still about, here. Yeah. And uh, tell us a little bit about the uh, label and um, where the wine is uh, distributed. The labels, our main labels that was created in 1984, it's St. Genevieve labels, which is our main brand. And we have, you know, several different brands now that is uh, made here and produced here. But the main brand is still St. Genevieve. And uh, a lot of people, you know, call this place, you know, St. Genevieve Winery. And uh, we process the grapes ourselves here at this facility, and we bottle it, and then we distribute it through a distributor channel. And we have, uh, our wine goes about, I think, you know, right now we're about in 14 or 15 different states. 
which our main buyers is actually in the state of Texas. State of Texas, you know, it's uh, probably, I would say about 75% of what we produced. And then we got some other uh, wines, you know, that go to Florida, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Arkansas, Oklahoma, you know, and, and so forth. So everything happens here. You grow the grapes, you press them, you ferment them, and then yeah. you bottle them. Take us through that process, if you would. So we start uh, pruning our grapes as a vineyard because this is where everything starts. You know, you need to grow grapes and try to grow grapes, you know, with high quality so you can make, you know, high good wine, have some good results. So you start with the vineyards and we start uh, pruning the vineyards generally January, February. We start pruning them because you have to prune those vines every year in order for them to produce fruit every year. So generally we had, uh, after the pruning, we have the bud break. That means what we generally call, you know, the blooming uh, in uh, April, which is the uh, end of March and April. And, uh, and then this is where we're gonna see actually uh, what the crops gonna look like, you know, for the season. And, uh, and then we start uh, our season, the grapes get ready in about the third week of July. So in the third week of July, this is, a, most interesting moment of the season because this is where we start harvesting. This is where we can see the result of all the work you know, and effort we gave you know, in, into the vineyard. So we have uh, grapes coming in you know, at night. We harvest at night. We start at 10 o'clock at night until generally 10 o'clock in the morning or unless you know, if we finish earlier depending what we were supposed to pick that night. And we do this you know, for two reasons. First, because in um, mid of July, end of July and August, it's actually, the weather is very hot. So it's better for the workers to work at night, so it's cooler. But it's also better for the grapes because we're receiving the grapes you know, at a low temperature, as, as low as it can be at that time. And so that saves us you know, some, a lot of energy cost you know, in chilling the juice down because we have to chill the juice down in order you know, to prepare for fermentation. We receive the grapes, we press the grapes, it's all harvested, you know, mechanically. And uh, we take the weight of those grapes so we know exactly, you know, how many tons we bring it in. And then after that, we, we do uh, two different uh, process for the white and one for the red. And uh, we are uh, leaving the grapes, you know, for about 12 hours in a tank. And they're just, just by their own weight, you know, they extract, you know, the juice, you know, naturally and we pull that juice out, the natural juice that was extracted. This is what we call the free wine, which is the best high quality juice that you can have to make wine. Then after that, we just extract all those grapes that are in the tank and we put them in a press, and then we're gonna extract two more juices. The juice is sent you know, to our cellar team where they start you know, filtration and starting you know, to control the fermentation. And depending on the quality of wine you want to have, then you can do a slow fermentation or fast fermentation. It's all a matter of the winemaker and our marketing strategy about where we want to go and what kind of high level product we want or if we just want to do a generic product, depending, you know, of course, on the quality of the grapes and the quality of the juice. And then when we're going to start the bottling process for a particular wine, then we're going to get some of that wine that is in the storage and we're going to work, you know, with it a little bit before it goes to bottling. Now for the red, the process of the red is actually we ferment everything inside the tank, inside the fermenters. And that means that there is the berries, there is the pulp, the seeds, everything is there. We let everything ferment you know, together, so we extract the colors you know, out of the pulp, out of the skin, and it becomes you know, red, any very dark color red, you know, depending which variety it is. Then we do uh, also pull the free run, which is the best wine because at that point it is not juice like the white but it is wine because it's already fermented so we get the free run and then we go to the press and we go the p1 and the p2 and then we go back to you know to exactly the same process you know as for the white and you know do some filtration do some chilling and you know and store the wine and uh, do the same process can you tell me how many bottles of wine y'all produce in a given month uh, within a month, uh, we probably produce in between 40 to 45,000 cases of wine, yes. 
I am very proud, you know, compared to when I came here in 1984, you know, the wine industry in Texas, you know, was, I would say, some kind of poor. Uh, I think, you know, uh, people did not have, you know, the, the information or uh, it was not very popular, you know, in, uh, in Texas. You know, Texas, you know, especially in West Texas, you know, people drink beer most of the time. So there was not a lot of people that was consuming wine, you know, in Texas. And, and I'm very proud, you know, for uh, the state, you know, of Texas to have developed, you know, so much wine industry, you know, in these states. And uh, there is a lot of, of course, it's not uh, due to St. Genevieve Winery here, even if we are the largest, you know, winery in, in the state of Texas. But it's uh, also all the other winery, all the other producers, you know, that work, you know, hand on hand to try to develop, you know, the Texas wine industry. And I'm very proud, you know, of all of them all work, you know, in that industry because I think, you know, as of today, you know, we show that Texas can produ produce some good, very high quality wine. I was working for a company uh, for about 10 years in the oil and gas business. And, and I enjoyed the camaraderie of the oil and gas business, but the actual business didn't do anything for me. And it was a corporate gig. Um, and I realized after a while it, it wasn't my thing. So I got with two of my best friends who are entrepreneurs and uh, took them to lunch. I just started talking and said, hey guys, I'm, I'm looking at doing something different. And, uh, and they said, what do you want to do? I said, I have no idea. They said, do you want to open like a barbecue joint or something? I said, I don't think so. And they said, well, uh, whatever you want to do, we're in with you. I was like, okay. So that gave me some confidence that, all right, I can come up with some ideas or whatever and talk to them about it. My sister just moved from here to Austin, to Dripping Springs. We were at a brewery called Jester King. And it's a big open space area. Kids were running around. Uh, I was eating a pizza and having a beer with uh, my brother-in-law, who's, who's one of my best friends. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I got like this, the, it felt like a slap in the face, like, this is what I need to do. This is what Midland needs. They don't have anything like this. I'm born and raised here. Well, I texted my guys, um, my best friends, and, and it took about 10 seconds for them to say, yeah, we're in, let's do this. And so it's one of those things where the best ideas come two beers in, the worst ideas come three, and that was like at two and a half. You know, I was at that half beer, is like the sweet spot, the small window, and I hit it. And uh, so I get back in town, and <laughs> me and Eric and Nicholas, my, my best friends, uh, <laughs> we're playing golf, and we're ordering brewing equipment or playing golf. Like, we have no idea what we're doing. These are like igloo coolers that you brew in, it's home brewing stuff. And we didn't have any intention on brewing ourselves. We just wanted some knowledge of it. We knew we were going to hire a brewmaster. And, uh, and we actually learned how to brew. It wasn't just a hobby. We had full intention in, intentions with it. And so it actually became pretty decent beer, we thought. But anyway, that's kind of how it all came about. Um, I've always been into the craft beer. And, uh, and I knew Midland uh, needed something like this that families can come enjoy. Um, and Midland is, I always think Midland's about five years behind other locations. And so it's actually progressing into getting more local. Um, so that's helped a lot. What is craft beer? Craft beer is, a, technically it's, it's within a certain barrelage. If you, produce, if you produce over a certain amount of beer per year uh, in barrels, it's not considered craft anymore. Obviously, we're not quite to that point, um, so that's what considers you craft. So it's, it's on a smaller scale. Yeah. Okay. If you're produced in on a small scale, yeah. so you talked about how you learned how to brew it yourself, but then you hired someone to do it for you. What is he called, and what does he do? His name is Jack Sparks, uh, and he's a brewmaster. He's been doing it 25 years professionally. He's from Dallas. He's worked everywhere. When I mean everywhere, I mean Alaska, Maryland, California. Oklahoma. He started the highest elevated brewery in the world in La Paz, Bolivia. Worked in Miami. We got him out of Miami. He left when the hurricane hit. We, we hit him at the right time and he wanted to get back to Texas. He's from Allen, Texas, outside Dallas. And he wanted to get back to Texas. We caught him at the right time. It just kind of worked out. He moved here. Uh, he loves it here. Uh, just has his, his dog and his dog's always up here with him. 
um, and he's fit in really well. He's made a lot of good friends, um, so it's, it's actually worked out really well with him. I've noticed that you all have lots of uh, creatively named beers. Can you tell me how those names came about? We didn't really want to necessarily go into the oil and gas theme. That's been played out before. Um, we want people to know Midland for different things. Um, so, for example, our flagship beer is Five Hour Drive. In Midland, you're five hours from anywhere. We say we're in the middle of everywhere, not the middle of nowhere. Uh, it's just five hours just down the street. You know, from Midland, five hours is nothing. You go to Dallas for a day trip. So five hour drive, that's Five hour why. drive. Haboob, Hefeweizen. Haboob is the big sandstorms we get. That was a catchy name rather than, you know, dust, devil, Hefeweizen, Haboob, and you get different playful variations off that. I'm sure you can imagine. We get uh, our ambers called two degrees of separation because in Midland, you're two degrees between anybody. I didn't know you if you came in, but you know my folks, so it just, <laughs> it's a conversation starter for sure. Uh, we have Bird Lady American Pale Ale because of the, the, the well-known Bird Lady that lived across the street that gave us our only forest view in Midland. There's a ton of stories about her, Midge Erskine. Uh, oh, my all-time favorite is the brown ale. It's called Rio Wadley because when it rains, Wadley becomes a river. And the, the beer is a brown ale, so it kind of looks like the water that's flowing down Wadley when it rains. Well, a minute ago you said that Midland is sometimes uh, behind trends. When you all first opened, were people adventurous in ordering five-hour drive? Or? If you weren't from Midland, yes, because they knew what to expect. If you were from Midland, then uh, typically we'd see them wanting something on the lighter end. And what would happen is you would kind of give them, you know, the five hour drive honey blonde and explain what's in it. They'll drink it, they'll love it. And that's all they'll drink or they'll trust you and move on to a new beer. Um, a, a big selling point we always did like with our stout was, do you like coffee? And they'll say, yeah, I love coffee. Okay, well, this is a very uh, dark roasted coffee flavor. It's very light, it looks heavy, but it's not. And they'll try it and they'll love it. And then that's all they'll drink. So. You get some adventurous. There's been a lot of, there's a, been some education going on that we've had to do, um, but people are very receptive. And um, sometimes people come in and ask for mixed drinks and we have to explain we're a brewery and it's our own beer and all that type of stuff. So, so, I mean, it brings them in and we're happy to have them. What have been some of the, uh, maybe a surprising thing that's happened since you opened the brewery? Honestly, the reception. We thought this would be um, a popular place. We didn't realize how popular it would be. We didn't, we, I, I didn't, fully understand how ready Midland was for this. Midland and Odessa and surrounding areas. Um, but people were ready to, to have something different, have something where they can take their kids, enjoy themselves with a the beer, have a burger, things like that. There just really isn't anywhere in Midland that has this type of atmosphere. Well, it's interesting that you said several times, bring your kids. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And people don't usually think of uh, a bar as a place that you would bring your children. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit about We're that. We're very, very careful that we don't call ourselves a bar because there's, there's a negative connotation with that in terms of bringing families in. I have three kids, so I wanted something if I wanted them to be able to come up here and, and you know, feel safe and all that type of stuff. So, um, that's kind of the atmosphere we've created. At first, it wasn't as much like that, but we've tried to promote that. Um, and people see other families here, so they're, they feel, uh, you know, confident that it, everything's okay with families in here. And we don't serve liquor, it's just beer, and very careful not to overserve and things like that. So. Interesting. And we, we close, the latest we open, or the latest we close is 10 o'clock. So we don't want to go too late. That's kind of when we see people turning <laughs> about nine or 10 o'clock. So we want to make sure that it's a safe environment. And a minute ago, you were talking about convincing people to try something different. Um, talk about the, sort of the, your taster menu. Is there an opportunity for somebody to try lots of different kinds of Yes, beers? yeah. We have what we call a flight. Now we'll give little samples if someone wants to try something. Um, we have some people that ask, they want to try like six or seven different beers. Like, listen, we try a flight. It's four five ounce tasters. You can pick any four you want. And then, or you know, what we say, dealer's choice. If they want us to choose four, then we'll do a wider range or whatever they want. And so we'll just, yeah. And then we'll label and tell them kind of about each beer. And then, you know, then they'll come back and say, I really like that one. So then they'll get a full pint of it. So. All right, so. So that's our five hour drive honey blonde. It's a light 5.5% beer, nothing too crazy but we add 90 pounds of Burleson's honey, Texas honey out of Waxahachie. Really honey. Mm -hmm. Yep, so there's a slight sweetness at the end. 
so it kind of takes away any bitterness from a beer. So that, that's a good gateway to craft beer is what we call mm -hmm. it. Yeah, so that's... That's really good. Sometimes you go to a cocktail party in Midland and they'll say, do you want Miller Lite or Bud Lite? Oh, or, yeah. And I was like, I don't want any of that. No, I know. <laughs> and we're trying to um, create a craft beer culture here where people go straight to craft um, yeah. and, and, you know, not do the whole light beer thing, yeah. you know. So that's the Bird Lady. And that's going to be, give it a, give it a sniff. It's going to be real piney real floral the hops come from the northwest so you get that piney notes from it it's some of the craft beer lovers most favorite beer of all time that one and uh it's piney so it makes sense you got pine trees at the bird ladies lot and it is. so that hits your palate or it doesn't mm -hmm. people that like that beer that's all they'll drink our I mean, broom that's our broom that's everyone in the back's favorite beer most of our servers favorite beer that's the hazy IPA. Give okay. that another sniff. That's more mango, tangerine, some pineapple, some orange. And you are you putting those flavors in? No, it's part of the hops. The hop profile gives it that flavor. Huh. And that's is the beauty. You smell hops, it just it's the greatest thing in the world. Yeah, this would be yeah. what I would order. Yeah, for yeah. Sure. That's a top seller of ours. This is great. Have I drank enough? <laughs> we can keep going. Hey, I got 12 more beers. <laughs> this one is good. I'm going to remember Hazy Yeah, Hazy Off. That's, that's become a really popular one. We released that last summer. Do you all also can and distribute beer? We do. We, we can our uh, Five Hour Drive Honey Blonde and our Haboob Hefeweizen. And that's, uh, we just started dis distribution of that. Uh, I think January 11th was our launch date. HEB, uh, Market Street, Kent Quick, Jack's. So those places like that's where those cans are. And we, in, we intend on bringing out um, possibly one more style this year, not to be uh, announced yet. <laughs> and there's more Basin beer brewing in a manual system in South Midland. Partners Jamie L. and Aaron Packelhofer produce a brand called Eccentric. I don't remember really craft beer becoming a thing until maybe the mid-1990s. Past that point, craft beer took a dip, and then, then it came back up. Um, from 2004, when I started brewing, I don't think I've really seen craft beer ebb. It's, it's, it's just kept increasing. Craft beer is a beer that, that somebody has, has taken the time to craft and make an excellent product. Um, so larger breweries that, that have huge volumes are still craft beer because they make, they make excellent products. They take extreme care. The, these are extremely large operations and they're still craft beer. Beer names are very situational. So, um, so a lot of times when, when I name a beer, it's, it's, it's either seasonally related or something that's happen, happening in my life. So I made, uh, made a beer for, for both my kids, uh, a animals who have passed away. In 2007, I went, uh, I brewed this beer, um, didn't have a name as a brand new recipe, uh, used a new hop that was available at the time. And a couple of days later, I went on a pig hunt uh, that was, extraordinarily successful um, and I came back as the pig slayer. Gotcha. This for me is a seven day a week job. It's my night job and my weekend job and various other times too. I've had to get up and be here in the middle of the night sometimes because you know you, you wake up and realize you left a valve open or maybe you didn't open a valve or you know, someone's been up here and says, hey man, uh, something's making a mess, I don't know what it is. And now you're up here with a mop. I've been at home, I think, for 14 years. And, you know, I did pretty good at it. I think, I, I like to tell most home brewers that I talk to, you know, if, if you're making good beer that people say, man, this just tastes like something I could have bought in the store, then, you know, maybe you could do this. Uh, my business partner, Jamie, and I got together and we're discussing it in my garage one night. We, we entered the entrepreneurial challenge and um, they, they gave us a substantial grant and uh, that was really what we needed to, uh, to fund the brewery. The brewery now sustains itself. We're in 25 places between Midland and Odessa and one lone outpost in Fort Stockton. 
Besides beer and wine, the basin boasts an abundance of folks in the business of spirits, including local investors in the production of tequila, vodka, and hard seltzer. Our painting today is a work by Ishmael Gonzalez de la Serna. He studied at the Academy of Fine Arts in Granada, Spain. While at school, he became close to the famous poet Frederico Garcia Lorca, whose first book he illustrated. De La Serna was considered to have more free artistic style. He moved to Paris as a member of the avant-garde group, and he was influenced by the Cubist artist George Brock and fellow Spaniard Pablo Picasso. It is claimed by the art critic Terriod that Picasso declared of De La Serna, at last a true painter, as grand as Juan Gris. He exhibited widely in the 1920s with much success. A renowned Parisian art dealer, Paul Guillaume of Modigliani, Pablo Picasso, and Henri Matisse, arranged for an exhibition of 50 of De La Serna's works. This led to an exhibition at the renowned gallery in Paris in 1936, the Spanish pavilion at the Paris International Exhibition in 1937, and later an individual exhibition at the gallery Fleischheim in Berlin, which was sold out. In his later years, in 1956, De La Serna had a retrospective at the Museum of Fine Arts in Mexico, which was followed by another retrospective at the Tate Gallery in London in 1963. Later in his career, he became more of a cubist painter. His use of form, color, and emotion reflect the influence of Cezanne and Pissarro. After a long battle with cerebral palsy, De La Serna became wheelchair bound, and from this point rarely ventured back home to Spain before his death in 1968. In 1974, the Museum of Modern Art in Paris held an exhibition in homage to his great artist. This work comes from Midland's Bakershore Fine Art Gallery. Finally, thank you for joining us for one question. We'll be back each Saturday at 4.30 where we will ask questions you want to know of the people who know. There are lots of ways to watch one question, including based on PBS Facebook, Passport, and YouTube. If you have a question, send it to us at onequestion at basinpbs.org. I'm Becky Ferguson. Good night.